Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm so delighted to welcome you to this evening's virtual conversation. And uh, our conversation tonight is going to be with uh, Dr. Robert P. Jones about his new book, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. And uh, my name is Emma Jordan Simpson, and I am the Executive Director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and the Executive Pastor of the Concord Baptist Church of Christ here in Brooklyn. And I am absolutely delighted and honored to be tonight's moderator. Uh, before I introduce Robert, I want to invite all of you to share your questions with us tonight by typing them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them as uh, the program is running along tonight. I also want to thank the Brooklyn Historical Society for hosting this conversation tonight and that it falls tonight when we really need to have uh, a conversation uh, that hopefully will help us uh, look toward the future uh, is just uh, a blessing. Um, and I want to remind you all that we are going to put in uh, the chat a link to the community bookstore, uh, which is located here in Brooklyn. Uh, we'll put that link in the chat and you'll be able to purchase a copy of White Too Long and you'll be able to get it from a local bookseller. So thank you uh, for being with us tonight. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Robert Jones. He is the CEO and founder of Public Religion Research Institute and a leading scholar on uh, religion and politics. Uh, he writes regularly on politics, culture, and religion. And his writing is frequently featured in major national uh, media. I was delighted last month to come across uh, an article he wrote entitled White Christian America Needs a Moral Awakening. And that title itself was intriguing. Uh, it reminded me of James Baldwin. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, James Baldwin. But Robert is also on the National Program Committee of the American Academy of Religion. And he holds a PhD in religion from Emory University an MDiv from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and a BS in computing science and mathematics from Mississippi College. That's a lot. <laughs> uh, this book, uh, this study really draws on history and public opinion uh, surveys and also personal experience to examine um, this relationship between white supremacy and American Christianity. And what I appreciate is that it also issues an urgent call. It's not just a conversation, a discussion of the facts, but it also issues uh, a current, a, a, a very compelling call for uh, Christians to reckon with this legacy of racism uh, and faith. So welcome, Robert. So glad that I get a chance to talk with you tonight. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, thank you. Yes. I want to acknowledge uh, up front um, at the top of our conversation, because I know that we're both feeling um, the weight of today's um, decision down in Louisville, Kentucky, on the, the Breonna Taylor case. Um, yeah. And, you know, what, what an opportunity, however, um, for us to use this moment uh, to engage in this kind of, of conversation. I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, well, very heavy. I mean, I've been getting, you know, been in conversation with friends in, in Louisville um, today who are all, um, I think, sad and um, worried and, um, you know, a lot of unrest, a lot of anger, a lot of pain, um, and um, I think just, you know, concerned and fatigued um, you know, um, at, at these events and, uh, and particularly just, you know, uh, the concerns around racial justice and, um, you know, I think with the Breonna Taylor 
uh, thing here that, um, you know, that we don't have an indictment of, of, of someone who actually, you know, shot and killed her in her own apartment. Um, that, and I think there's a lot of people feeling just dismayed um, and angry um, about that. And yeah, I think it's worth acknowledging that we're going to talk about, um, you know, that as, as we go. But I'm, I'm really happy to, you know, say her name and, uh, you know, just name this thing I think is on so many of our minds before we jump into this larger conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do want to stay here for a moment uh, longer because um, I mentioned that this is a mixture of history and this compelling research, you know, the statistics, but it's also for you a bit of a memoir. Like this is a personal undertaking for you. And so I want to start there. You know, mm -hmm. what, why are you a privileged white American Christian man, you know, child of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention denomination. Like, why are you writing about the legacy of white supremacy in American Christianity? What does that mean for you right now? Yeah, um, well, um, you said it's, it's a personal book. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, so yeah, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi um, as a Southern Baptist and um, I was really involved. I mean, I was that kid who was at church like five days a week. Every time it was open, I was there. I was active in the youth group, kind of in a leadership role. And then I went to a Southern Baptist college and then I went to a Southern Baptist seminary. So I got a, you know, a degree and um, a master of divinity degree from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, you know, I think part of this is a, a reckoning of my own, um, in a way, and kind of, you know, putting down on the page, um, a, a way of thinking through my own evolution and my own journey um, on many of these issues. And so, you know, to start with, uh, I think one of the things that I have realized, certainly in writing this, is um, how utterly invisible um, mm -hmm. racism, white supremacy was rendered to me as a kid um, and growing up, you know, uh, white and Christian in, in Mississippi. Um, and, you know, and that is true, even though I grew up, I like, I remember I was in elementary school in the 1970s, for example, when the first African American kids came to my all white school. Um, so, you know, and that's a good two decades after Brown v. Board of Education, yeah. uh, of course, but Mississippi drug its feet for nearly two decades on finally getting around to integrate the public schools. Mm -hmm. And even though like I was living through that moment, um, there was no reflection, no commentary at my church. I can't remember hearing a single sermon on civil rights, racial justice, what was even going on in our own schools right around us, why that was happening. There was like no conversation whatsoever. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s um, at, uh, in, in a seminary class that I even understood the origin of my own denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention. And that is that, um, you know, we, uh, we, were the, can, can, we were the denomination formed in 1845 explicitly over um, uh, the issue of slavery. And, and, and the issue was uh, that there was a rift between Northern and Southern Baptists over whether clergy uh, could enslave other human beings and still be in good standing as Christian clergy. And the Northern Baptists re rejected that view. And the many Southern Baptists, Baptists in the South, um, who thought it was perfectly consistent uh, to, be not, to be not only Christian, but a, a Christian leader uh, mm -hmm. and enslave other human beings on the, uh, because of the color of their skin. Um, that was the normative view that founded, um, that was the founding principle of the Southern Baptist Convention in 1845. And I didn't know that until I was in my 20s. I mean, that, that history had been hidden even from those of us who were the most active in our own uh, denomination. So between that sort of repressed history and then just absolutely no attention at all to systemic injustice, civil rights, or even like the role of white, white churches in, in uh, resisting segregation of their own congregations, and in resisting the desegregation of the schools, none of that was on uh, the plate. And so I think this has been a long journey, a long evolution, uh, just in my own life. And um, I think the events of the last five years, you know, uh, or a little more, even um, uh, the killing of Trayvon Martin, uh, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, um, you know, this kind of just litany of uh, things, uh, Dylan Roof killing nine African Americans in Charleston, uh, with the uh, and and who was a self-professed Christian, you know, right? Um, we we should be calling him a white Christian terrorist, but that's not language that really got used around him. Um, and and I think this amnesia or this kind of um, myop myopic view of of white Christianity's role um, is is I think some, a story that I needed to tell for myself, 
Um, and and I, I think that, that we need to tell for the sake of the health of the, not only the faith, but the country. Mm -hmm. We we'll talk about uh, origins, and you talked about the, you know, the origin even of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. I'm wondering, um, because I've always thought that uh, Christianity, white Christianity in the United States, really learned how to be as violent as possible uh, from this experience with Native Americans. And I wonder if you if you are looking at really sort of the birth defect of mm -hmm. America, and um, and the real problem with American Christianity, why not start with an examination of the Amer the subjugation of native of indigenous peoples? Mm -hmm. Why why begin with you know black white? Well, you know, I think it has to do partly with, um, uh, the, you know, the book being written as a memoir, right? And that this was really primarily my experience. Um, so I really tried to ground um, the examples that I used in things that were connected, you know, to, my, to, to, to me, sort of my experience. When I do um, talk about, though, the, um, uh, the, the deeper history of my own family, though, back um, in middle Georgia, um, so my, my, both sides of my family actually go back um, six generations, um, you know, back to the early 1800s um, in, in Georgia. And when I, at the end of the book, I kind of say, look, we all need to learn how to tell truer stories, like about ourselves and how we got here, truer stories about our family. And when I tell my family's story there, um, it, it does begin with um, the, the kind of best documentation I have, you know, with the arrival of my ancestors, again, both sides of my family, sometime uh, around the turn of the, um, turn of the 1800s. Um, and they're arriving um, on land that has been forcibly cleared uh, mm -hmm. of its original Native American habit inhabitants, right? And and they're, you know, we we often use these words like pioneers and you know those kinds of things, white settlers and and these kinds of language. But but I mean, they were inheriting, uh, you know, they got a 200 acre plot of land that was carved up in a nice neat little square, um, but that had been after um, you know widespread Native American. Uh, removals that they then made that land available to uh, people like uh, my sixth great grandfather who had served in the Revolutionary War. Um, that's what he got as kind of part of his benefits uh, from what was Native American land in Georgia um, that he was able to. So I mean that 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 story is certainly there. Um, I mean the other I think piece of this is that um, you know white Christianity doesn't invent um, you know this sense of white supremacy uh, when it lands on the shores uh, of the U.S. It goes much much, much further back than that, um, uh, you know, and, you know, you can go back as far as, um, you know, the, the 15th century, um, even prior to the Reform prior to the Protestant Reformation, with the Doctrine of Discovery, which is 1493, which we have a papal edict um, that says, um, if white European missionaries and uh, explorers um, show up on uh, other lands that are occupied by people who do not practice the Christian faith, they can forcibly take those lands and consider that to be condoned uh, by the church and and by God. Uh, and so this was 1493, right? And this is like way, way back. And so the doctrine of manifest destiny, uh, this sense of kind of entitlement, um, and and that it's it's not just sort of um, that it's divinely ordained, right? It really is seen to be the will of God, right? That this is the role of white Europeans uh, in the world is to quote unquote civilize others and to see themselves at the top of the uh, racial hierarchy. That's it's all the way back. So it's built in even as as uh, white Christians, you know, land on the shores um, of the, of the early colonies um, here here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So how so in your own journey, uh, what came first? Like, were you looking for at you know digging into your own story, or did the research come first and it led you to look deeper into? your own story? What came first? Yeah, you know, I think it's hard to really put a finger on it, um, really. I mean, I think, I think like many people, it's a, it's a kind of organic process. I would certainly say the seeds of it are, um, you know, my parents, um, who very clearly, um, while they weren't like political activists and, um, you know, weren't overtly kind of, I think, educating us, um, you know, to be anti-racist, but they were certainly putting some distance between my brother, my sister, and I, um, and the Jim Crow South that they grew up in, um, that uh, in, in Macon, uh, Georgia. 
Uh, so I think having that buffer that gave me just enough critical distance, I think, to kind of see it from the outside and not be so immersed uh, uh, with it that it's hard to see out of it. I think that was absolutely critical. I think having, um, you know, uh, professors um, that were really important in my life um, and, and, you know, and a Baptist professor at a Southern Baptist seminary who, in fact, was the first Baptist professor to put in a textbook the real, re the real reason for the founding of the denomination that textbook was published in the 1980s. Like that tells you how late it was mm -hmm. uh, that even, you know, a Baptist historian would be frank about the cause of the Civil War, a guy named Leon Macbeth. Um, so I owe, you know, and then, you know, and, and a lot of cognitive dissonance um, for decades um, that I think I sat with and coming in and out of view, um, very messy um, in a process. Uh, you know, I do think that, you know, it's crystallized more um, I think my graduate education uh, certainly, you know, helped um, reading, uh, you know, tons of folks like uh, Cone and uh, Cornell West and, you know, many other folks that certainly I didn't have connections with growing up. So reading a lot of African-American theology that um, really did change my views um, mm -hmm. on some of this. And then I think the last five years have really been, been critical um, where, you know, I think things that even previous to five years would have been, they certainly were there, they, they weren't, hadn't gone away. Uh, but things that I think were either whispered or said in dog whistle code words coming out right into the open, right? Where we see white supremacy just right in front of us without apology. Uh, those chants in Charlottesville, uh, you know, uh, Jews will not replace us, blood and soil, um, you know, the neo-Nazi uh, slants. And, and again, like Dylan Roof uh, murdering Nine African Americans um, at Bible study, mm -hmm. uh, right, um, and doing it in the name of his own twisted version of, of white Christianity. I mean, it, it it was very much wrapped up in his religious views, not just in his racist views. Mm -hmm. These were one and the same thing for him, mm -hmm. and and trying to take that really seriously and ask ourselves, okay, like if we're going to reckon with this, like how do we how do we start doing that? How do we start telling the truth? And I, and I think Bob, we mentioned Bob at the top of the top of the show here. Um, you know, Baldwin, I think, was also someone I read who really changed my mind about many things. And op I would say opened my eyes. And one of the things I think he challenged me to do um, was to do what he saw his own writing doing, and that was bearing witness. Like he kind of used this Christian language um, of bearing witness to the truth as best he could see it. Um, and I think that's one of the most admirable things about him, in addition to his um, immense gifts as a writer, was his courage and willingness to just not flinch um, and tell us the truth as straight as he could see it. Um, and I, I think I've, you know, I certainly have been kind of challenged and inspired um, to try to do the same thing from, from where I sit. And so I think a lot of the book I do see is just trying to bear witness to the truth um, in a way that might start a different set of conversations and actions that can hopefully get us to a different place. Mm -hmm. I believe it will. Before we get to your research, because I do want to give some time to that, and then uh, I, I see that there are questions already popping up, uh, so that we can understand, frame this, like how are you defining white supremacy? Mm -hmm. And how are you defining whiteness? Uh, and then, you know, we can uh, jump into um, your research. Yeah, um, well, you know, white supremacy, I'll start, I'll start there. I, I, I kind of wrestled a little bit with kind of um, using the term, mostly because I, I know that most white people, when they hear the term, think, oh, that's not me, right? There's kind of this immediate defensive um, reaction, and people think, oh, that's the KKK, that's people burning crosses, that's people lynching people, that has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of inoculate themselves from kind of thinking any further um, mm -hmm. about it. Um, I'll, I'll borrow a term from Eddie Gloud, um, who's a, a professor of African American Studies and Religion at Princeton, um, who wrote in um, Democracy in Black, a really great book I would recommend, um, as well as he's a new book on, uh, on James Baldwin, actually, uh, called Begin Again. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Um, but, but, you know, he, he um, talked about uh, white supremacy, uh, quote, without all the bluster. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a good way of thinking about it. Um, it's something much more common, much more banal, uh, really. Um, and so even if we just flip the words around, and instead of white supremacy, where we kind of have this reaction often, um, we think about it as the supremacy of whites. Mm -hmm. And just unpack that a little bit further uh, and make it communal and social. Um, and that is kind of, you know, being in support of a social arrangement that protects and values the lives of whites at the expense of others. 
Mm -hmm. um, I think is really what I mean by that. And, mm -hmm. and if you, if you think about it that way and you think about everything from restrictive neighborhood covenants that uh, protected all white neighborhoods and better areas of the city, um, you know, uh, pushed African-American neighborhoods near industrial centers and flood zones, like those kinds of things, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, with worse schools, uh, uh, restricting certain jobs, uh, certain benefits, who could get loans, who couldn't. I mean, it, it's economic, it's social, it's cultural, it's kind of all the way down. And there's really no way of reading um, American history straight without realizing that that has plagued us for all of our history. Um, it's with us today. Um, you know, even, even with uh, COVID-19, right, we have 200,000 deaths, but those deaths aren't evenly distributed. Um, you know, African-American, Latino Amer Americans are twice as likely as whites to uh, have been infected and die um, of a disease. Um, and I think a lot of the complacency we're seeing among whites, uh, particularly, is, is really linked to that, um, that, that, that this has impacted uh, communities of color much more. And that and on the issue of whiteness, um, you know, it, it's uh, you know sometimes they use a phrase like you know those of us who have thought, grown up thinking of ourselves as white um, as one way of kind of thinking about the construct. Um, and you know, it's it's again Baldwin I think here is really instructive. And you know, he talks really about the power that whiteness in particular has had in the American mm -hmm. context, right? So you know, he's like, look, when people came over um, from Germany to America. Uh, well, in, German, in Germany, those people were German. Uh, in France, they were French. In, in Britain, they were British. And, you know, um, and in, uh, you know, uh, Denmark, they were Danes. Uh, it's only when they get to America uh, that there is this kind of umbrella category of whiteness that really takes hold. And what it really means, right, is, a, is, a, is entrance to a protected privileged category. Um, uh, that where, where many rights and privileges are, are um, kind of constrained here. Um, and everyone else is kind of kept out. And it's also worth noting, I mean, how elastic this category has been uh, throughout American history. You know, so Jews, uh, historically, not white. Uh, Italians, not white. Irish, not white. Um, you know, e even on the U official U.S. census forms, well into the 20th century. I mean, if you were Irish, you had to check Celt. If you were Jewish, you had to check Hebrew. Um, you know, you couldn't check Caucasian. Um, like, that was not your box. Um, and so, but, you know, but this, these categories have kind of expanded, but always I think whiteness has been about um, a kind of protected class that is um, kind of protected as the top of the pyramid and certain rights, privileges, and powers reserved uh, for those who could make a claim to that category. Yeah. So in your book, you contend that, um, that white American Christianity's theological core is what protects you know, it's this structured, um, um, protected interest. And um, so what is that theology? What is yeah. that theology that serves to protect this supremacy and whiteness or the supremacy of whites? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's a big claim. So, I mean, I, I make a claim in the book that, um, that white Christianity hasn't just been complicit, right? It has not just been sort of an incidental thing. Uh, but that it has been actively involved um, in uh, perpetuating, you know, this idea of white supremacy um, in the country. And one of the ways of kind of thinking about that is, you know, is just that it has white, you know, Christianity has been part of the sort of dominant culture uh, among, you know, people of European descent. And so not surprisingly, it has been the tool that has been used to legitimize uh, this worldview. And there's no greater legitimacy you can give something than to claim that it is divinely ordained by the creator of the universe, right? That is the one of the most powerful claims you can make about something being legitimate. I mean, who can argue with that, right? If you can really make the case that the creator of the universe uh, has in fact ordained this particular thing. And that was precisely the argument that was made um, really. And so it was built in very early, um, you know, again, all the way back from the 15th century forward, this has been under the hood of, of, of white, of the kind of engine of, of white, uh, Christianity has been entangled, um, and it's been done for so long, I kind of argue in the book, that it's actually become embedded really in the DNA of, of white Christianity today, and we can still see it today. But to the point of, so, so it's not surprising that it's really gotten connected to the theology um, here uh, in so many ways. But, and it's not that surprising if you think about um, what early church looked like um, in the American colonies that were either supportive of or tolerated uh, the enslavement of other human beings. 
And in many of those churches, you know, what you had was uh, whites who had enslaved others uh, bringing enslaved people to church with them, whites sitting in the front, enslaved people sitting in the back. And if you ask yourself, well, okay, what kind of sermon could get preached in that environment? What kind of prayer could get prayed in that environment? What scriptures would get read and which ones would absolutely not get read um, in that environment? It tells you a lot about the early shape of lived Christianity um, in the country and that legacy that was built there you know, for centuries, um, not surprisingly, is still with us today. I mean, we've hardly begun to reform uh, the theology. And just, just one example here, you know, um, a, a biblical one, uh, you know, this, this text of, um, that was used well into the 20th century about the mark of Ham or the mark of Cain, um, which, which uh, really did, again, reinforce this white supremacist worldview. And the way it went was this, that um, the explanation for the existence of dark-skinned people in the world can be traced to this story of uh, Cain murdering his brother Abel. Um, and when God comes and says, what's happened to your brother? And he sort of first denies it, but then God finally pins him down and says, okay, you've killed your brother. And he marks Cain. Um, and, and the text really doesn't say anything about skin color. Um, he just says that he gives him a mark. It doesn't say anything other than that. But white Christians uh, and clergy begin to interpret that passage as the origin of dark skinned people in the world. Now, what that does, right, is it then gives white Christians one lineage that goes back to Adam and Eve um, that is a very noble one, right, that, uh, of, of people that, that the creator formed with the creator's own hands. Uh, and the origin of dark-skinned people in the world is a criminal act. Yeah. Um, it is literally the murder of one's own brother. That, and so there is this um, kind of tracing the lineage back to, it, to not to an original being that the creator crafted with their own with with um, uh, the creator's own hands, but with someone who created a criminal act, and then that justified then this moral hierarchy, even right um, that that whites had this kind of more noble history, uh, dark skinned people had uh, this morally suspect um, history, and then you just read that into the current uh, into the current thing. Um, there's many others I could give, but I mean I think those were, you know. I think to the modern ear, some so that may sound a little ridiculous, but um, it was. I mean, this is well into the 20th century. You can find these these passages being cited in exactly this way. Yeah, well, it's not lost on me that even this summer, um, the Baptist Calvinists, like you know Tom Nettles and Albert Moeller, uh, not at the seminary that you went to, but Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, mm -hmm. um, who suggest that um, for enslaved peoples to um, to you know run away was it was immoral on Christian grounds, and that's 2020, and they're still yeah <laughs> arguing and contending. Um, yeah, I mean last month too. I mean Eric Metaxas, who's one of the best-selling authors in evangelical and the evangelical world, was with a straight face arguing that Jesus was white. Mm -hmm. I mean, on Twitter was having this like epic battle about Jesus being white, like literally, which is clearly an odd thing for someone who's a biblical literalist to say. Um, uh, but given that what the Bible does say about his origins, um, uh, the Middle Eastern Jew, uh, but nonetheless, um, this was the argument that was being made. Yeah, exactly. In, in 2020. So it's, it's yeah. really uh, not that far back there. So um, let's talk about the racial attitudes of whites today and this racism index that you have created. Like, tell us about that. Yeah, all right, you wanna put on my social science hat. Yeah, um, yeah here, um, yeah, so, so, you know, at the heart of the book, I, th I think is um, trying to figure out like, well, so what, how does this show up for us today, right? So it's mm -hmm. one thing to kind of tell this history, even if it's very recent history as we've been talking about, but how can we really think about measuring um, this legacy and, and again, kind of, maybe testing it for the DNA, kind of its, its existence in the DNA of white Christianity today. So um, it's a little bit challenging with public opinion data to measure kind of racist attitudes because you can't exactly ask people directly um, mm -hmm. about that. But what, what I did was I built um, what I called a racism index that is a collection of um, 15 different questions. Uh, so it's a, it's a lot of questions, more than a dozen questions that cover a lot of different ground, um, everything from uh, it, the police treatment of African Americans, criminal kind of disproportionate uh, sentencing in the criminal justice program, um, the um, system, the uh, uh, economic mobility, 
you know, all kinds of other kinds of structural racism, racism issues. Um, and, and what I found in that um, uh, there is this, this massive gap among whites. And I think I'll start there. Uh, this gap between whites, those on the one hand who claim to be Christian of any kind, I mean, so, so not just evangelical, uh, but who claim to be mainline Protestant Christian, and those are, you know, kind of the more liberal end of the Protestant, the white Protestant world, like Episcopalians, Presbyterians, United Methodists, um, and white Catholics um, who have their own history of discrimination in the country. But, but what I found was, uh, so I scored this index um, on a scale of one to 10 with one holding the least um, uh, racist attitudes and 10 holding the most racist attitudes. And what I found is that white evangelicals, again, who have been heavily, you know, uh, in the South, perhaps not surprisingly, scored eight out of 10 um, mm -hmm. on, this, on this racism index. But what's maybe more surprising than that is that white mainline Protestants and white Catholics scored seven mm -hmm. out of 10 um, on this, this racism index. And if you look at whites who are not Christian, then I think this really shows you um, the work that Christianity is doing. If you look at whites who are not Christian, they only score four wow. um, out of 10 mm -hmm. on this. And African-Americans are at two, right? Mm -hmm. So if you ask the question, like who is closer to the views of African-Americans on these questions of systemic racism and their experiences of systemic racism, white Christians are not the answer. Whites who are not Christian uh, is the answer to that, um, that question. And it turns out that this is actually quite a robust relationship um, that even when I controlled, for example, for a bunch of other possible uh, uh, alternative explanations. So maybe it's that they're more Republican uh, and that's why there this correlation exists. Or maybe it's because they live in more rural areas. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's education levels. Um, maybe it's gender. Maybe it's um, you know yeah region of the country. I, I check for all kinds of this. And even controlling for all of those factors, this independent relationship between holding more racist attitudes and identifying as white and Christian holds up. So it tells you that it's actually the Christianity piece that is doing uh, the work. And just one more I think piece on this that was I think surprising um, is that. Uh, you know, I think you might also think, okay, well, maybe it's just these people are just Christian in name only. So maybe they don't really go to church. Maybe they haven't been discipled or they're not like, you know, in, in worship services, just claiming to be Christian. Mm -hmm. But even when I looked at attendance patterns, what I found is that at best, um, uh, religious attendance made absolutely no difference. Uh, and so in other words, people who attended less white Christians who attended less frequently were just as likely to hold racist attitudes as those who attended more frequently. And if I just look at white evangelicals, the kind of group uh, that I'm, I grew up in, um, it, it actually is quite remarkable um, that, um, that actually attending church uh, more frequently uh, made people hold more racist attitudes, right? So in other words, this relationship between holding racist attitudes and identifying as the white evangelical was stronger mm -hmm. among high church attenders than it was among low church attenders. And I think this tells you just how deep um, this problem goes. Again, it's not just white evangelicals in the South, uh, but it is, uh, you know, white mainline that are more populous in the Midwest and the Northeast and white Catholics who are even more urban, you know, in, in the, in the North e Northeast as well. Mm -hmm. As you contend, this really hasn't been a North-South kind of thing, that uh, this has been a white Christian thing, North, yeah. South, East, and West. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me um, just quickly on this point, um, you know, also read a fair amount of Frederick Douglass, um, you know, working on the book. And one of the things that he was most dismayed about after the Civil War is, I, you know, is he basically writes that he, he thought the issue of slavery, um, that settling the issue of slavery, all right, ending this practice would um, have a great effect on people's attitudes around white supremacy in general. Mm -hmm. And he was like, dismayed that that was not actually the case, that actually many whites saw slavery as one thing and white supremacy as something completely different. And, and one example I'll give, um, you know, that's actually from, New, from the state of New York, um, is Charles Finney, um, who was a Presbyterian, white Presbyterian minister, and he was a staunch abolitionist um, and uh, was, you know, defended, debated people on the issue of slavery, uh, spent a lot of time organizing um, and, uh, and once that question was settled, though, he had a, a young protege who was approaching him about organizing an integrated worship service. And he stopped him in his tracks and he said, no, 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 you misunderstand. Um, the issue of abolition and amalgamation are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and basically said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm for abolishing slavery. We are not for 
race mix, mixing the races, um, you know, in, in this way, and, and was still hanging on to this. Uh, and I think that that actually was also, for me, uh, really important insight that the Civil War uh, did virtually nothing uh, to settle the issue of white supremacy. The Civil Rights Movement did very little to settle the issue of white supremacy. Um, and that we have really not reckoned with that underlying issue. Um, we have, you know, Baldwin talked about, you know, the, the bill coming due, um, and we have not been willing to pay it. Um, and I think here we are again, um, in many ways, with this another moment of reckoning, which is, I think, another moment of opportunity uh, mm -hmm. for us, really, to finally uh, deal uh, with these debts um, that we have incurred uh, by not uh, you know, not really being honest and telling the truth about um, how, how white supremacy has been with us and being willing to commit to finally, um, you know, um, excising it from our, from our midst. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard many people uh, comment that maybe in the last, you know, four months or so, uh, particularly after uh, the George Floyd case, that maybe mm -hmm. white attitudes have changed. But I know that you've uh, done some research since then, and maybe that's not the case. Yeah, you know, it's it's a really uh, mixed bag. Um, on the one hand, we did see um, in the early weeks after George Floyd's George Floyd's murder, um, um, white attitudes and white Christian attitudes um, actually being fairly positive on the Black Lives Matter movement, and much more so than they had been back in 2015, mm -hmm. for sure. And even anecdotally, um, you know, like I'm I'm here in Maryland. Um, just outside of DC. Um, and, you know, I have a, a, a friend who's a pastor of a UCC church. And in 2015, he put out a Black Lives Matter sign on his church that got vandalized and burned three separate times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, and I think that's not what we're seeing now. I mean, we're seeing much more acceptance and support, I think, even among predominantly white churches uh, for the Black Lives Matter movement. But, our, but the more recent data um, that we've seen has shown that these gaps that I mentioned before are largely still with us. I mean, on the question, on the specific question of the killing of African Americans by police, uh, for example, we are still seeing a 25 percentage point gap between white Christians of all kinds, again, not just evangelicals, who are majority saying these are just isolated incidents with a few bad apples. They're not part of a pattern. They're not part of systemic racism in the country. Uh, whereas whites who are not Christian, uh, majorities, uh, strong majorities, saying, no, these are part of a pattern and agreeing uh, with African Americans. Um, and on the issues of Confederate flags and monuments, we're actually seeing attitudes move in really the wrong direction. In other words, white Christians are actually become more insistent uh, that the Confederate flag and the Confederate monuments are actually uh, just signs of uh, Southern pride and not symbols uh, of racism. And those attitudes have actually moved five or six points uh, the wrong way. And then in just the last month, uh, we've seen some slippage among whites overall, white Christians included, um, in support for Black Lives Matter. So we see some support go up over the summer. And in the last month, we've seen some of that taper off um, uh, and, and flag a bit um, in the last few weeks. And as we've probed underneath that, um, even we're doing some focus groups on this, what we're finding is that many white Christians are, um, uh, I think, mixed and, are, and have really bought into uh, the idea that that the protests are largely violent um, and uh, and are are becoming more sympathetic to kind of a law and order kind of argument uh, that they're hearing uh, from President Trump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to just go back to Baldwin for a moment, and then yeah. there are a lot of questions in this chat, so we're going to get to those also. Uh, he was really good at turning, uh, you know, notions on on the head. Um, you know, with you and the supremacy of whites and not white supremacy. In, in, in 1963, he did this interview where basically he said the great victims of, uh, in this country of the institution called segregation is white people. Mm -hmm. Basically, he's saying is we don't have a black problem. We have a white problem. And then in this conversation with Lorraine Hansberry, he's referring to a conversation with Lorraine Hansberry. And um, he, they're, they're talking about, you know, uh, the, the specter of uh, Black people being brutalized and white people watching this brutalization and not feeling anything. Mm -hmm. And so he says, the quote is, uh, these people don't think I'm human. And this means that they, they have become themselves moral monsters. And so um, 
like what about your what of your conclusions do you think might contribute to white american christians saving themselves from the fate of being mm -hmm. yeah monsters i this goes i think right to the heart of the matter I, i'm gonna i'm gonna read one more baldwin quote back to you um <laughs> uh, here um because i i think it's it's actually where the title of my book comes from so white mm -hmm. too long is actually from uh, a quote from james baldwin um and he um you know, I think for most of his, you know, writing in the in the '60s, he was he was he like King. I think was kind of optimistic. He was hopeful that whites would ultimately step up, right? That that whites would ultimately see the cause. Um, and after King is assassinated, and after Bobby Kennedy is assassinated, he writes this next passage I'm about to read from a real moment of just of kind of despondency. Um, I think after after that hopefulness and after seeing King cut down. Um, and and even even after King's assassinated, there's not this great uprising among white white Christians to the cause. And he says this. Um, this is again is where the the, the quote the title comes from. Um, I will flatly say that the bulk of this country's white population impresses me, and has so impressed me for a very long time, as being beyond any conceivable hope of moral rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. They have been white, if I may put it, too long. The effect on their personalities, their lives, their grasp of reality has been as devastating as the lava which so memorably immobilized the citizens of Pompeii. They are unable to conceive that their version of reality, which they want me to accept, is an insult to my history and a parody of theirs and an intolerable violation of myself. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very consistent you know, with what you're reading. And, you know, and, and at the, the end of the book, um, I do talk about this, and you know, there there is um, uh, there are reasons to 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 really embark on this uh, this work of reckoning that have to do with justice to people that we have wronged. I mean, that is that's very clear. Justice and repair uh, is is a real motivating factor and a and a moral cause that ought to be very salient. But beyond that, um, there is great. Uh, this is not a merely altruistic pro project, I think, for the reasons that you say, like, if we really want to ask, like, whose religion has been twisted and deformed, like, whose perceptions of reality have been uh, warped, um, it's not African Americans, right? It's white people's uh, uh, perceptions that have been, you know, uh, Baldwin even talks about it as, as almost a kind of madness, um, you know, that is, that is kind of taken in um, by, by having to live with this commit, these kind of deep, deep cognitive dissonance between a commitment to white supremacy and a commitment to Christianity and making these things compatible for centuries, mm -hmm. uh, right, has really, that, that does damage to one's psyche and to one's mental health uh, mm -hmm. and moral health. And, and if you want to speak in theological languages, it, it damages one's soul, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so I think that that in itself, right, it, there's an internal reason for white Christians to take up this work that isn't about um, just you know, you hear this like uh, just being politically correct and all that, but it, it is really about um, if we think seriously about like what kind of a faith are we going to hand to our kids and to our grandchildren? Um, it is about like faithfulness in the present and integrity in the future. I mean, it is something that is is very internal um, to to white Christians um, and the whole future um, of of the faith. So, I mean, there is enormous amounts of things at stake um, here, not just for us, but for our for our kids and our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the uh, some of the questions. Um, there's one. How do you suggest structuring conversations that advance critical self-reflection on race within white Christian communities when they are most often utterly devoid of diversity? <laughs> what scriptural yeah. texts do you draw upon? Yeah. Um, well, the, the first thing to say is that I think that's exactly right. I mean, the, the latest data I've looked at is that it's it's about 85% of churches that are essentially monoracial um, today. Um, it's a little better than the past, but not much. I mean, Martin Luther King's uh, you know uh, note that uh, 11 a.m. on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America is still largely uh, true. Um, and so I, I think that's that's a challenge uh, here. But you know, one thing I would say is that there is some work. Um, that, that white Christians can do even in a very homogeneous environment. And I, I'm going to say something, uh, you know, like personal here. I think one of the things that I did um, just as a personal practice when I was first starting working on the book was I just journaled 
a bit and I asked myself a question that only someone who grew up thinking themselves as white can ask. And that is, where did race even show up for me as a kid, as an adolescent? That, that question is like nonsensical to anyone who hasn't grown up thinking of themselves as white because uh, it's everywhere. Um, but for those of us who grew up thinking of themselves as white, race was sort of, you know, by design, rendered someone invisible. And so bringing that to consciousness and bringing that forward, I think, was an important part of the work. And what happened with me, I think, is that once I started sort of catching one thread and I just pulled that one thread, it was connected to other stuff and it just began to unravel. Um, and so I think just beginning that process and then being willing to, to do that in community, right? So that's an individual process. But then can you tell the truth about that? Can you tell a story about that? to people you're in community with? Can you share those stories? Because once you do, it's gonna engender other, uh, other stories. And, and just one from my own family's upbringing, um, even in talking with my own parents about you know, many of this history that I have in the book, um, you know, I, I, there were things that came out that I didn't know. And probably had I not even started the conversation, my parents probably would have gone to their grave with it. Um, like for example, um, you know, I found out that um, there was this practice in the 1960s as churches were resisting integration of their own congregations, that they would actually station deacons on the, on the outside steps of the church at the beginning of the service to prevent any African Americans from entering the building um, and to prevent any mixed uh, group from coming in uh, and integrating the service. Um, and I, I found out that my grandfather was one of those guys. He was a deacon at East Macon Baptist Church. Um, and that that was one of his jobs on Sunday morning was to kind of stand out there and basically be a, a not only a deacon, but a bouncer, um, mm -hmm. you know, outside, outside the church. Um, and so I think we start telling these stories. And then I think for white Christian churches, um, a, a couple of simple questions, you know, one simple question, for example, is if, if every white Christian church in America were honest about this question, why is our church located geographically where it is? Mm -hmm. um, you would very quickly get to race and most of most of the answers to those questions. If it's an older church, it's probably in an area of the city that was designated a whites only sit part of the city. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a newer church, it's out in the suburbs or exurbs. Why there and not back in the city? Why in this suburb rather than another? Um, you know, and it, it's mostly because this is where there were white people, right? For us to kind of build a church that was essentially all white. So I think being honest about those conversations, and then I think trying to do the hard work of building some community, because there's a lot of work that can be done there, but I think ultimately it is going to have to be uh, rebuilding ties and rebuilding community with African American uh, churches and, and institutions where there can be, and I, I talk about in the book, a couple of churches that are trying to do this work, um, and it's, it's messy and um, there's no real blueprint for it, but kind of stumbling their way along with a commitment to build community and to be honest um, there. And I, I think all of, all of those things kind of move together. I, there's no 10 step program here, I think, but um, it's not actually that hard because this history, uh, both personal and public is actually not, it's just like you scratch the surface a little bit. It's right there. I just, I think you just have to be willing to kind of open ourselves up to it. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing sort of a theme also in some of the questions um, where people really are expressing fear. You know, uh, they're wondering, you know, what do they do? <laughs> how, how, um, how, how do they start? And uh, yeah, so uh, there was one in particular I was trying to, to pull up. Um, he says, uh, what do you say to those of us, white and non-white, who are afraid of those with malevolent intent? He says, I'm a Jew born and raised in the cocoon of New York City, the cocoon of New York City. And I've never been so afraid of the country's direction. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, it's a, we just did some focus groups, like I said, um, and, you know, I think we were hearing this too. People are confused, people are afraid. Um, you know, and I think it, it's, it's true that, that many of the things that have been submerged are just now out on the surface, right? So I think in some ways, these aren't new, right? These aren't new fault lines. They're just out for all of us to see. And I, and, and I actually think that there's something, um, even, even as scary as that is, I, I do want to say, I think there's something hopeful in that, right? Again, that you, you can't really address something that you can't see and that you can't name. Uh, so I think if, if there's any virtue, um, in um, these just open conflicts is that it does give us an opportunity to name what's actually in front of us um, and to try to really um, deal with it. I do think it's gonna take 
um, you know, some courage um, on on all of our parts, I think, to really stand up. And I, I really do think the, like, I, the first chapter of the book is, is titled Seeing, S-E-E-I-N-G. Um, and I think that is really the first step. And, and in order to see something, we have to tell the truth um, mm -hmm. about it. Um, and I, I think, particularly for those of us who are white and Christian, um, it's pretty clear, you know, what that is. And I think we have to say, um, and we're going to stand in the gap. We're going to stand in solidarity to our Jewish uh, brothers and sisters, right? For, I mean, you know, when I heard in Charlottesville, um, and I'm sure every, you know, Jewish person in America, when, when I heard, that, I mean, literally chanting, Jews will not replace us, right? Mm -hmm. While holding tiki torches and marching around the statue of Robert E. Lee, I mean, that is no joke. I mean, that is, that is serious. We've seen an uptick in, in hate crimes, an uptick in hate groups. These are all documented by multiple ADL, SP, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, have all documented these these trends. I mean, so it, it's really real here. But I think the underlying sickness, you know, is something we've never really dealt with. And so I think uh, these are the symptoms. We got to get to the source. The source really is this underlying commitment to white supremacy um, that really has been undergirding, you know, so much of so much of white Christianity and so much of our laws and um, uh, and and even you know are still again still with us today. Uh, there's a question. What has been the response to your book from <laughs> evangelical uh, Christians, mainline Protestants, and Catholics? Yeah, um, well, as you might imagine, it's been a wide range um, of, of responses. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm happy to say that um, it's probably been, I don't know, three or five to one uh, positive. Um, and, you know, I don't know really what to make of that, but that's that's been about what it has been. I mean, I've, I've certainly gotten plenty of angry phone calls and emails, um, uh, thankfully no death threats at this point, but, um, but certainly, you know, angry things. But, but I, I think it is because, you know, this is real. I mean, it's a real thing we're, we're dealing with um, here and it's a real moment of reckoning, um, you know, that I, I should say also that I, I would not have anticipated, uh, again, when I turned the manuscript in a year ago, um, that we'd be at a moment like this. I mean, when I turned this manuscript in, in Richmond, uh, I spent some time in Richmond doing research, and I walked down Monument Avenue uh, in Richmond past five massive uh, Confederate monuments, uh, and the statues of four of the five of those are now gone, um, you know, just all gone over the summer. Um, uh, a year ago, the Mississippi state flag had the Confederate battle flag in it. That's now gone. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's some real uh, signs that, you know, not only the kind of chaos um, and the scary things are happening, but I think there are, there are some signs that some real positive change is taking root. Um, and I, I think we've got to kind of make sure we're putting our energies uh, really toward uh, certainly resisting, you know, things we need to resist, but also in kind of pushing forward, I think, these positive changes. Yeah. So along those lines, you talk about in the book, traveling the country um, as you're doing the research and learning about um, groups who on the national and local level who were trying to tell a more truthful story about America's past, trying to deal with the shape that um, that past, you know, has sort of uh, created and are imagining um, a better, you know, future. So you want to, who were those groups? Yeah, um, well, you know, they range from the local, you know, to a few denominations. I mean, I will say the Episcopal denomination um, has, uh, which, which I should say also was, you know, the denomination of Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee. I mean, that was their, that was their denominational home. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, for example, in Richmond, um, Episcopal churches that have stained glass windows dedicated in the church uh, to Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis and Stonewall Jackson, right? Um, up, here's, here they are, here's Jesus and Moses, and here's you know, the Confederate Trinity um, over here. Um, but but the, they have been doing some serious things on reparations, for example, um, like Virginia Theological Seminary has put together um, uh, more than a million dollars uh, in, in a kind of reparations fund. Um, I know that the Episcopal domination is uh, doing more of that. Um, I mentioned these two Baptist churches in, in Macon that, um, that I <coughs> kind of profile um, that uh, that that used to be the same church um you know they they were they were that situation i described earlier of white whites who brought enslaved people to church with them and then split and have been ignoring each other they've been kind of in existence for 150 years around the corner and in the last seven years um really have made a courageous move to try to build community there and it's really been 
um, I think life changing for the, 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 the people in the pews and I think particularly transformative for the white Christian uh, mm -hmm. churches. They've been um, really challenged to tell, to tell the full truth about it and to try to think about what repair uh, really means. And I wanna make sure I get that in is I, I do think too often white Christians and maybe whites in general think that you know, the goal is reconciliation um, and I think reach for that really quickly. And one of the reasons why we reach for that really quickly is that it's really uncomfortable to sit in a place of confession and lament and apology, right? That's just totally right. Um, but what that move does is it skips uh, often the work of repair. So the formula for many white Christians, I think has been white lament and apology in exchange for black forgiveness equals reconciliation, right? And we're done. Um, but I, I think that if there's something I've learned from watching, I think many of these groups that are really doing the work, um, it is that um, what really is required, uh, particularly on the white Christian side of things, is the work of repair and justice. Um, and in fact, one of the, the white uh, ministers, Scott Dickinson, um, in that church in Macon said he stopped talking about reconciliation. And mm -hmm. I actually think it's a great idea, mm -hmm. actually, for white Christians to just stop talking about reconciliation. Because here's the thing if we talked about and did, the work of justice and repair long enough, I'm pretty sure our African-American brothers and sisters will tell us when we're reconciled, right? It'll come as an organic outgrowth, right? It'll be something that's real and that actually happens mm -hmm. as a result of the work that we're actually doing on the ground. Yeah, uh, Dr. Shaniqua Walker Barnes in her, her book, um, I Bring the Voices of My People with me, and she's talking about racial reconciliation from a black womanist perspective. And the image that she describes of, of just how we get this wrong is that um, we see this sort of as, you know, pack a football stadium with like thousands of black men and white men and they hug it out. Mm. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> they just hug it out and then we are reconciled. And but, you know, the white man goes back on, you know, to his life and the black man goes back on to his life. But they've thought that they 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 think that they have done something that uh, has reconciled them yeah. when they haven't. Yeah. So we are at time. We are at time. I want to give you the last word. Um, um, I want to, you know, encourage everybody. Uh, please come into the chat and uh, to follow the link so that you can purchase um, and. What would you say? What would be your last word? Yeah, I'm going to say like one word to challenge. I think I'm looking at the chat, the chat too. And um, one word to challenge, I think, I think to my fellow white Christians here um, uh, is, is this, I think, I think we often think um, when we think at all about the civil rights movement, I think we often like to think that we would have been on the right side mm -hmm. of that equation and the right side of, of that action. Um, and, and I'll say this, like whatever we're doing right now, is what we would have been doing in the civil rights movement. So I think kind of holding ourselves accountable to that, if we want to think of ourselves as being on the right side then, let's make sure we're on the right side now. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, I think um, I'm going to give the last word to James Baldwin, actually, because um, uh, I think this is amazing, uh, you know, quote that, um, you know, he, he talked about bearing witness to the truth as the first step toward healing. Uh, and that if we can find the courage and the love, I think, to do that, and these are his words, um, we will end the racial nightmare, we will achieve our country, and we can change the history of the world. Amen. Amen. Robert Jones, thank you for talking. Thank you. Tonight. Thank yeah. you for writing this book. Uh, take care of yourself. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks for being here.